In this episode, we're going back to 1987 and the debut album of an artist that became a polarizing figure in music. Sinead O'Connor is the artist, and The Lion and the Cobra is the album. Stay with us. Get ready for the 3324 Podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome, friends, to this episode of the 3324 Podcast. Eric, if this was a, an episode of Friends, mm -hmm. this would be called The One with the Sore Throat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Also, another morning edition. So, here or we are take, in the take two of again. the morning. So, that's right. <laughs> we we <clears throat> we tried to uh, do this episode yesterday morning. Doesn't make yes. a difference what day it is. We tried to do it yesterday morning, and I was in the middle of a sore throat. So, I actually, I don't know if I sounded worse. I think I sounded a little better. Um, so, we were kind of going through it, and uh, not our fault. Yeah. But this, you know, the services that we, you know, we got almost, we got more than halfway through it, or we were, you know, pretty much on the way, mm -hmm. um, and it and it crashed. Yeah, it just we so lost everything. All that, we lost all everything. That fine discussion we were having too. Yeah, so we're gonna replicate it. Wait, we're giving you a yeah. little bit. This is a little bit about how the sausage is made. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I woke up today. My throat feels better, but my voice sounds more hard, more hoarse. You sound a little froggy. Yeah. 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 Got a tiger in the tank, <laughs> but but either way. So what I've got today is I've got some green tea. <clears throat> uh, this is the Mandalorian blend. There you go. This Grogu. This is the the child green tea. He has his own fields. I don't know what planet these fields are on. Mm. Uh, I guess he's got a staff that harvests the the, the tea before it's mature, uh, and he makes his own. Gro you know, Grogu makes the child uh, green tea. A little bit of so the that's, force that's in there, a little bit of those medicinal. Uh, it's th this tea is a force to be reckoned with. I'm sure there's a little bit of a maybe dad some joke. midichlorians in there, perhaps. I, I could use them. <laughs> I could use that. anything at this point. Let's get that shit out of your system. So, yeah. so thank you to Grogu and, and his uh, his entrepreneurial spirit that is making the green tea for me. If you're on YouTube, you you just saw it. Uh, if you're on YouTube, <clears throat> do us a favor. Go ahead and subscribe. We would appreciate that. If you're listening to us uh, on, on a mobile device or whatever it is, well, thank you for joining us as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we and we appreciate it. We enjoy doing this e each and every week. It's always uh, a lot of fun, and it gets more challenging as we get through and, and we kind of cut away our favorites and the easy ones that we may have like really kind of banged out on our list. Right. Uh, it becomes, well, what do we want to talk about next? You know, and, and we go, you know, we start cu cutting down some levels a little bit deeper. And I think this is one of those. Uh, I think yeah, it's, it's all about the discussion. You know, yeah. it's, it's nice to open it up a little bit and, you know, just sudden, let some yeah. new ideas form and, and, you know, stuff to think about and stuff to chew on. So, yeah. Yeah. There's it's, more to life you know. than Phil Collins and Jeff Lynn. <laughs> Not much more, but probably very little more. Yeah. But there is a little more. There is a little more. And this a is one bit. of them. This is, uh, you know, Sinead O'Connor's debut album. Let me get in. Let's get into the stats and we'll talk a little bit about the background of it. Mm -hmm. This was released in November of 1987. She was in the later stages of her uh, pregnancy with her first child mm -hmm. when she during the recording of this album. And she's the same age as us. She was quite young. Uh, let me see. This was recorded 86. So she was like 20, 21. Yeah. In, in that ballpark, uh, going through pregnancy and recording this album. Produced by Sinead O'Connor and Kevin Maloney. Uh, all songs written or co-written by Sinead O'Connor. Hit number 36 on the Billboard charts. Not bad for a debut album from a virtually unknown artist with like no connections or, uh, you know, like, oh, not a protege of somebody. An right? international <clears throat> artist to boot. Yeah, know. from yeah, Ireland. From Ireland, yeah. I Irish, the land of U2. I mean, they're, they're, they're like the big guys. Uh, this was certified gold, this album, so it... It sold over 500,000, but less than a million. A million will get you that that platinum mm -hmm. award. Um, and it was nominated for a Grammy. It didn't win, but it was nominated for Best Female Rock Vocal. Yeah. And I don't know who won that year, but I don't think you can dispute that she... Uh, her voice is something special. And it's 
really more never more apparent than on this album. I mean, this album really she just goes through so many different. Uh, we talk about it a lot with with music. We always talk about yeah. music. Oh, this this album, you know, so or, or or Steely Dan has a lot of different textures to it. The music has different textures. Right. Her <laughs> voice, her vocal <clears throat> instrument, her voice has so many different textures to it. Oftentimes in the same song, as well. Yeah, yeah. I would argue that. I mean, she could have done this album a cappella, and it would have been a, a very very interesting to listen to. Yeah, something that would definitely hook you and and you know, it, yeah, I I often think I wonder if there was some sort of like rarity out there that that has these that kind of thing you know these tracks they're done just her singing yeah it would be it would be nice to put a, yeah you yeah. know we we always lament or you you lament more than me about when special <laughs> editions come out I do that there's re, like remixes or like dance remix and stuff right I would say you know what I, what what I would want to hear on on a remixed album this mm -hmm. would be the perfect. This would be the perfect, not a remix album. This would be the perfect special edition for any album. Yeah. Any album you could think of is is remaster the original, give us what's called a stack of tracks, meaning give us all the tracks without vocals, and then give us all the vocals without music. Yeah. If you got, if you did that for every release, you would have a great package of music to listen to. Because mm -hmm. then you could just listen to the vocal stuff and, and, and appreciate it. Then you could listen to the... You know, like we like to the arrangements and what or what went in or what didn't go in or how right. sparse are they? Um, I think that that should be like the standard for like no, special I, editions and then anything else you want to throw in. But I think that should be like a standard. I can see that. I don't, I don't, I, you know, for the record, I don't like remixes so much, yeah. like especially when it's done by other artists that are coming in and kind of doing their, their yeah. own thing, their own spin on it. That's just not, that's not what the album was intended to be. And maybe the maybe the artist enjoys that, like like a like a rapper or somebody will yeah. come in and do his own like you know whatever. No, that's not what I'm I'm talking about. Like like you're saying, alternate takes of a song or yeah. or just the music or just the vocals. Pet sounds sessions was was a prime yeah. example of that. You know we, we yeah, talked this, about the, that before. But yeah, yeah, this would be great just to hear her voice yeah. isolated um, because her. I wrote down I wrote down a bunch of adject adjectives. To describe at least what what I get from her voice, yeah, haunting, vulnerable, soaring, mm -hmm. screeching, sometimes shrieking, tender, mature. Um, this is a lot for a twenty one year old. Wide range who's, of emotion. There. Yeah, who's yeah. Yeah. and like I said, she often will cut through so, a lot of these in one song where she'll sing, uh, and, and she'll do it with a lyric that's repeated. So she'll have a lyric. Um, I think like I just like you said, it would be there's she'll sing it the same one lyric like in a very tender way yeah. and then she'll say sing the same exact lyric right after but in it with a with a, a sarcasm or with a bite to it yeah uh and, yeah. and it takes on a totally different tone and she's doing that changing those tonalities within the song and it, so it's it it, it it is more kind of what life is like mm -hmm. you know these sound like these sound like responses a lot of these songs sounds like responses to things or conversations that already happened mm -hmm. that we're not privy to Right, right. So, so the the songs don't tell you the whole story. These songs are are almost and and for her, she said it was like her therapy. Um, that these were things that working out after the fact, so we don't get all the details, and you don't necessarily because you're getting the emotion. Right. That's yeah. that's contained in the songs, and you can kind of pull from it. You know where where she's at or what she's feeling. Yeah, and you know this this is stuff that traumatic stuff that she'd gone through like in her her very young life at this up to this point and you you can imagine i just i can't yeah. imagine not a happy childhood the pain that she was going through and she was only 21 at the time sure yeah. i mean that's you know and there were a couple other artists that that had to deal with that so i could think of like tori amos went kind of went through the same thing alanis morissette to a certain extent had that that debut that first mm -hmm. uh serious you know, album where they're dealing with stuff that they just, you know, that is extremely yeah, and that, that makes, that, or, that makes yeah, it good. You make a good, you make a really good contrast. So Alanis Morissette, yeah. so her album or or that song you want to know is very descriptive of yeah. events, right? And that's her yeah. way of of working through it or catharsis, right? She's she's kind of really uh, graphically descripting describing mm -hmm. things, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Sinead O'Connor is more okay. That it happened. I don't need to talk, you know, I, I, what I need to get out is my thoughts about it afterwards, yeah. you know, and, and, and not directly address what the, what the things were, which is a very, you know, you, you bring up a really great point of, of that's a really interesting contrast to listen to artists that 
tell you everything and you get the you get the story and you get the emotion from that or artists that don't tell you everything and they let the the emotion or the textures of the song kind of bring it through and that's what that's what lion and the cobra is right it's it's a little less personal that way and you have that knack of, of writing a song that that, be, that anybody can pick up and and identify with or if, mm-hmm. if needs be if a fan will will pick up on that type of song and you know whereas you know like you say like alanis was was talking about a very specific situation and and giving her you know whatever but if you can sort of twist around that and skirt around the issue but tell that story and you know internally that's what but that artist was feeling but mm-hmm. it's more universal it's out there for the fans to digest and yeah. and just you know identify with and and yeah, that's where you build your fan base i guess you know if you're a great songwriter so yeah you know, yeah e- either you know. way like you know because alanis yeah. morris i mean that album was just gangbusters so she just she people were 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 ready to hear hear uh stuff in that way as well yeah. right they were ready for that that brutal openness yeah right from yeah. a from a female artist of yeah why well, if a guy can talk about the things he does or sure. you know stuff he's done that isn't necessarily the greatest stuff or or haven't been treated the right way why can't a woman do it and she she absolutely did it and they um, and they have that in common where they where they kind of got that all out of their system in a, to a certain extent and then their yeah. second album is a little bit more mature they're, yeah. they're exploring new new you know new types of music and that kind of thing Certainly the same is true of all, I think, of, of all three, Tori and, and Atlantis and Sinead O'Connor. I think yeah. they, and, you know, we, we talked about, like, sort of the idea of them revisiting this this stuff, like, in a, in a concert set, setting. Mm-hmm. Would, would that be, like, you know, do we, you know, are those songs stuck with you? Are, the, are, are they the most important songs, or, or can we embrace new songs you know you know down well, the road you know, in, so. in the in, well in the case of just to not make it a last more set episode yeah but I she know. she just toured like on the 25th anniversary of jagged little pill and right. like and and you know uh performing it in in its entirety because it's so so iconic yeah Sinead o'connor has said listen i don't want you know i love these i love these songs online in the cobra i don't i don't need or want to perform them again because for mm-hmm. her Right, it it was therapy for her, so she doesn't want to, in a way, you know, reopen stuff that she's worked on that she's you know been through those therapy wounds, for, yeah, you know, those. Sure. Yeah. So so for her, it, it's it was music, but but it was was a way of of her working out things. Um, for us, we wanna we want to go to the concert. We want to go to the concert and hear it. Yeah, and and kind of yeah. If, if I was going to go see her now, I would I would hope she would play Lion in the Cobra stuff, but she obviously would would not. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. you know that begs the question. In, in in the case of Sinead O'Connor, who's just let, let's let's get to the we'll, we'll circle back on on where you're going with that. But I think because okay. I think we need to talk about <laughs> yeah. I think we need to talk about <clears throat> th- this out. Like what when did you first hear this album, or when did you first encounter her? Because I think we need to give the background on on her. Um, and, and our it was, connection it was the singles. It was Troy. It was Mandinka. You know, her done on the radio. I thought they were very interesting. Her voice was really what got me because I was already into this kind of exotic type of stuff that was happening in the 80s with like bands like Talking Heads and Peter Gabriel and mm-hmm. and not not necessarily the the, sto- the sort of stoic prog stuff from the 70s, but they were exploring new new territories with their music. And I felt like she was kind of fit that mold, you know, just because her, her voice was so odd, you know. Mm. Um, and, and and when I bought the album, I was re- pleasantly really surprised by it. I was It was more, for me, I embraced the art rock of it, you know, because every other song is, is so, sort of different. You have those pop hooks in it, but there's also enough for me to, you know, to, to, uh, to really enjoy. You know, like Peter Gabriel So had just come out a year earlier, so I really was really digging on that and his earlier work. And then working with people like Kate Bush and, you know, Laurie Anderson and, and, and those types of artists of more little sort of art rock avant-garde kind of thing. And I, I kind of dug that stuff. So she kind of really, I put her in that kind of same category. And what yeah, she's, she's got those ethereal textures. Yeah. yeah on on yeah. this album, it's got those ethereal textures, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a little, a little bit, not a bunch, but there's a little bit of prog. So, you know, uh, uh, on there, just a little bit, um, and then there's like, like you said, there's some, some pop hooks, which got me, there's some funky, mm-hmm. you know, I want your hands on me is kind of funky and just kind of lends it, lends itself the, the single when they released it as a single, they didn't release it as it was on the album. 
uh for the official single release they got the rapper mc light who was very popular at the time yeah uh one of one of few female rappers maybe her and queen latifah were the only ones of, of note um to to kind of team up and that became the the de facto release of the single because it fit just so well that song just already had the funk in it mm -hmm. so it only made sense to bring in mc light to kind of enhance it and kind of put those put those extra pieces in you know yeah. so it's very very interesting and, and <clears throat> i came to it at the same time when, when the album came out i was working in in crazy yeti which is insane a, 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 <laughs> prices are insane which is a, yeah. a now way, way long defunct uh consumer electronics retailer in the in the new york new jersey you know tri-state area of new york mm -hmm. um known for their off-the-wall commercials and i used to work in the record store so they would have you know sample sampler cassettes that you'd have to play of different you know like you know cbs records would have a sampler of their artist he'd play that and, and this kept coming up you know yeah uh, i think it was mandinka was was coming up in jerusalem i think were the two cuts that might may yeah. have been on that and really uh kind of piqued my interest and then mm -hmm. you know when, when i <clears throat> finally looked at the album you know it kind of was it kind of challenged it, ch it challenged me because up to that point you know female rock vocalists were had you know had a certain look not not to be sexist but it was kind of stevie nicks and wilson debbie harry like you know linda ronstadt that was the, that was the look and here's this this young irish woman with with a shaved head making a bold statement and the and the record company's like well you know what are you doing like why are you doing that you know yeah. um and and actually the funny thing is is after she got popular she started to grow her hair back and she said people you know what i, I need to shave my head again because people are mistaking me for enya yeah. <laughs> so she goes like like she wanted to grow her hair back but then she said i couldn't because people thought i was who enya is just a she actually makes an appearance on this album but enya would right. have a she does as another yeah. irish uh irish vocalist who was was very popular and and people kept mistaking her for enya so she just mm -hmm. got pissed off it's like well, it's, you know like you know so it, it became yeah. it became some it, it became challenging you to look past looks yeah. right because it, it can be very superficial with women in rock and roll can be like, oh you know she's got to oh, be this pretty the or whatever. 80s too so you, you had know, that that sort of glamour yeah and you, you had know, the hair you had the big hair going on and all that hair, kind of stuff the you know the you know yeah the whole yeah bit, so so, you know, so so this challenge this challenged some of those notions you know and I was okay with that I was like you know it didn't make a sure. difference to me because of of what was contained in the album I didn't care what the person looked like at that point mm -hmm. because after listening to the album and hearing her you know what she could do I was I was just I was blown back I was like she's just absolutely in incredible it's um, interesting to note that there's two separate covers of yeah. on this album there's the international cover with her sort of like looks like she's actually screaming yeah you know but she's actually singing uh in the picture like in the photograph and then, yeah. then of course there's the more subdued u.s version with her just sort of looking down and being sort of reflective and yeah they didn't I like think them the, both i think they i like i like the european bad. cover better actually i, well, I, I do too but i, I, th I, like, I think that more embodies you know, i think that embodies the album yeah it is more yeah. you mm -hmm. know they 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 shot the u.s cover because they wanted it to be gentler for audiences right they want to pander yeah. to that and say oh you know well it was shocking to see a woman a bald yeah. woman <laughs> to, not only know. a bald woman right. but then a bald woman with that with that look on her face that's but, right yeah you know i i i when i saw that that album cover it wasn't until relatively recently i'm like right. i love that album cover so much better yeah you know so i'm actually gonna have to go and get uh <laughs> we'll have to get a copy it. from the uk no i'll just, I'll just get yeah. it from discogs and have them, there have, you them go. Ship, have them ship me a copy there so <laughs> um yeah th this was um uh, just a really you know and at the time in 87 you know there was just we were in like quote unquote hysteria you know, from Def Leppard, mm -hmm. uh, Appetite for Destruction, Bad from Michael Jackson, The Joshua Tree, Faith from George Michael, Sign of the Times, all these big artists. Yeah. Right? Permanent Vacation. This was, That was Aerosmith's return to, like, the top. Uh, Whitney Houston's second album, Whitney. Yeah. There was just so much, so many big artists that came out. Um, and and Sinead O'Connor was nothing like any of those. Like, no. that was the thing is... is you can consider it a rock album, uh, but I'm not sure. Is it closer to world ish? I, I would music. Say so. I, it doesn't yeah. have those flavors. It's got rock to it. The closest thing would have been right. Joshua Tree. I mean, you you would you think, think it so? was sort of more akin to what U2 was doing. U2 that was their breakthrough, sort of like mainstream. I think more. But you know, when you consider their earlier work, their more political 
stuff and you know that kind of thing you would think that there's sort of a kinship there but I, yeah. I i don't think there was actually i think i don't think bono really thought much of Sinead O'Connor, as a matter of fact, I think he kind of just kind of dismissed her. As, I think she did the same you know, as well. I think she you know, kind of, yeah, you know, had, like that, kind of had that attitude of, you know, that's right. Yeah. Fulcum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, you know, and, yeah. and, and it's, it's interesting because, you know, after this album came out um, and it did OK. Right. We said number 36 for for a debut album from a virtually unknown artist with, yeah. again, is swimming in, in that the pool of 1987 of what was mm -hmm. coming out. Um her following album would come out in 1990, which would be I, uh, titled I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got. And that would, she exploded, right? Yeah. The, the song Nothing Compares to You was on that, which is a cover of a Prince song. Mm -hmm. um, it went to number one. The album went to number one. It so, you know, went two times platinum. And now all of a sudden, Sinead O'Connor was uh, everywhere. She was a commodity. But, you know, the, the question becomes, you know, well, let's talk about, let's talk about two years later. Yeah. She she appears on Saturday Night Live in 1992. Mm -hmm. And she's singing a song, very just kind of mainly her, not a lot of backing. Um and during the during the rehearsal, um she held up a photo. I forget what it was. It was something unrelated and, and you know, she, you know, kind of held up a photo just to show to the camera, kind of like an activist type thing. Um but when she did the live show, mm -hmm. she held up a picture of of the Pope. And she tore it up and she made a statement and everybody lost their shit. Yeah. yeah. Like literally yeah. the war. I don't know if you remember at that time, but the world, the world, it, it became, it became the, the world, it became the world against Sinead O'Connor. That's right. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, for, for someone who, you know, clearly at that point crossed the line from pop star to, to activist. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and can, can you be both? Um, I'm not sure because because of of the the stance she took, and she she ended up being right because she was against you know the she you know right. sexual abuse in, in in the Catholic Church, and at the time everyone was clutching their pearls of oh my God how could you how could right. you say that? Uh, and it turns out she was right, but she was bullied incessantly, even so far as Madonna, who two years earlier hypocritically had the song like a prayer. Yeah, what what's in the, what's mm -hmm. in the music video for life like a prayer? Yeah, there's burning crosses. Burning crosses. There's, there's, she's in a wedding yeah. dress. She's like crawling around on the floor. She's, and, she, you know, like, it's all these all these religious symbols and, and, religious and all icons these stuff. that are just you know, yeah. yeah. And, and right. she has the nerve to then say, "Well, I think you went a little too far." That's right. Is that it? Maybe maybe is it maybe because then Sinead O'Connor's getting all the attention at that point, and and it was off of Madonna because <clears throat> Madonna had that erotica okay. book or sex book and the the uh, CD erotica. Yeah, you know, to kind of come in. Um, she certainly did it in, I mean, you know, coming on the scene as she did, we talked, we just talked about the album cover and, you know, maybe people weren't really, didn't really know at that point what she had gone through necessarily or, or even her political views, you know, enough to, but the way she just came out and, uh, you know, just did it like that. I mean, that yeah. was extremely bold. It was extremely, and we don't know what was going on inside her head and fe in, in Case in point, the the photograph in question was actually a, a picture of the Pope that was hanging in her mother's house, and that to me also has there's a little bit of that there too because we yeah. come to find out that you know her mom was abusive when she was very young. She died when she when Sinead was very young, so she was very angry. So that could have been you know something about that as well, tearing that picture because it was so personal. Mm. But we didn't know that. Nobody knew that. Yeah. You know. So, but to do that on national tv yeah i mean you, know, you can understand the, the repercussions of it but it was just but but she was right you, you yeah because you know, like yeah, all, all people knew from her then yeah. was that was right. the music video nothing compares to you which is a close-up of her face mm -hmm. kind of soft focus singing a love song crying you know and it, it was all over mtv so everyone thinks oh it's yeah. just kind of pop you know yeah she's you know it's quirky she's bald or whatever um but no, there's there's some there was something behind all this. There was something yeah. there was something that was always brewing that's in right. her music and and in line in the Cobra, it's there. Like you I would, think that's that's where it is. Is you go back to this this album, and the stuff is th like th those seeds are there. You you can hear it in the way she spits spits lyrics out and su yeah. with such yeah such contempt sometimes for right. for whatever the situation is. But yeah. then sometimes also very tender. 
and very loving and and, mm -hmm. and talking about relationships. It, it's there beforehand. The fact that that album wasn't the big one, that her breakthrough was a little bit more, you know, radio friendly or, or poppier, that all of a sudden people had these preconceived notions. Preconceived and they notions just destroyed her. They just destroyed her. They uh, absolutely destroyed her, which which I think, I, I had to contribute to a lot of that. She had a lot of mental issues going down the road. That's right. Um, a lot of Americans thought that, oh, there's this angry Irish girl. Yeah. And that's all it was. Like, oh, she's from Ireland. There's so much crap going on over there. She's I, We don't want to know your politics. Yeah. She was speaking in a much broader yeah. in a much broader way, both personal things and, and, and everything. I mean, she would, you know, anything that she could be an activist for, you know, any kind of injustice in the world, she was... Yeah, she was she was there. She commented on or yeah. she she would jump into that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that begs the question from earlier is is yeah. pop artist or activist? And and mm -hmm. can, can you be both? You know, um, Bob Dylan, you know, Bob Dylan, we, you know, kind of it comes to mind. But Bob Dylan wasn't an activist. Yeah, Bob. Bob Dylan was a commentator. But but was, Sinead is, com is, is making yeah. commentary as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, you know, in the '60s, you know, Bob Dylan was kind of commenting on what was going on in the world. Right. That's where all these people connected to it. She's doing just the same. Why? Why does he get a pass, and she didn't? And she just did one one thing. Yeah. But the world, you know, the world just kind of blew up in her face. Her next albums, you know, she she put out an album right after this with of uh, of jazz covers, mm -hmm. um, which kind of highlighted her vocal her vocal prowess that she could handle. That you know, as an artist, she's most certainly can, to be reckoned to be reckoned with that's right she can she can quote you know sort of go right from one thing to another and she has that ability but i kind of look at it like i, I think i met i you know i kind of it not that they're alike in any way but i kind of look at her as sort of the art rock version of nora jones and given the yeah. fact that they're both sort of very very talented in that sense that mm -hmm. they can leap into all different genres and and do and, and and work with a lot of different people too to boot so yeah in, within those genres, you know, whether it's jazz or a little bit of blues or, you know, whatever, um, they both certainly are kind of like savants in that way. And, you yeah. know, they're so musically there, you know, so that's great. So you, you mentioned Mandinka. Yeah. Which, which was, I think that was probably the first song I heard. And I just, you know, that's got the hook. Yeah. It's got the hook. It's got her great, it's got a great soaring vocal from her. Mm -hmm. Um, it re and, and her, I, I'm not going to try and sing it. Even even if I wasn't having a sore throat, I wouldn't try and sing it. But just the way her her vocals lilt at certain points, it really kind of like I when she sings like I don't I don't know no pain, I feel no shame. It's like it kind of goes up and down, like the 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 vocal kind of goes like it's almost, almost like, like a, a roller coaster. And it's and it's almost like she's chanting, like yeah, yeah and it's, yeah, but it's, yeah. Uh -huh. it's done so yeah. smoothly, yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. effortlessly that when I heard it, I'm like, oh wow, like that's what kind of grabbed me. I'm like, oh. Right. I, you know, and, and then, like I said, I heard Jerusalem, which is kind of very like a uh, shimmery, guitar-y, kind of like a, almost like a core. It sounds like stuff you were hearing from like some of those English groups like Sisters of Mercy or The Mission. Like it, it kind of had some some roots right. in that. Mm -hmm. um, and and do, do you think, you know, it, it, since it came out in 87 and we, we talked about some of these albums, there, there was a certain sound in the 80s. Um, I, I think it comes close to skirting that line of course you know it's yeah. it's it, it's 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 held back just enough but because her vocals she's such a good vocalist that she can battle with with the production I meaning she can hold her own against against the production because some of these songs are right. really really well like there's a lot going on in, and then some are very sparse that's right um but yeah. the, the stuff that's that's thicker and, and more well produced i think she also can hold her own against. she doesn't get lost in the sauce i do and and uh, as much as i love mandinka by itself as a single, I think it, I like it even more when it's introduced by the first track, which, which is Jackie. Jackie. Yeah. And what gets me about that song is the fact that it, 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 it chugs along and it keeps building and it's building and it's building. And you think at some point that it's going to explode into this like very polished production produced type of thing where all the drums kick in and, mm -hmm it's just going to explode, but it never goes there. It just, just keeps it steady of that constant build. And then you have that, that, that pop hook kick, uh, kick of, of Mandinka, you know, right after it. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like that one, two punch, perfect blending of, of two different, 
two very very different sounding songs but they just so they just work so well it's almost a ja jackie is almost a, you know like the introduction to mandinka yeah you know yeah, it's, it's like a it's, it's like a it's prologue a, to the whole album it's it's, it's short great yeah it's yeah. short it's atmospheric yeah it kind of gives you an indication of what she can do but but mm -hmm. if you only listen to that song you think oh, okay this is going to be like this kind of stuff you know like right and exactly. you're right and then, and then mandinka mandinka just kicks it just kind of kicks right in and you're getting something really kind of up tempo poppy and she's handling that great and again with her her particular vocal spin you know it's like that that Celtic that Celtic way of singing where the vo the vocals really go up high and yeah you know I was listening to certain tracks on this and and her voice just sounded like no vibrato she's mm -hmm. holding notes and they're not wavering like they're right. just they're held strong and true and I'm I'm like geez like what like usually there's going to be some at the end even even the the strongest vocalists you know kind of start to give up the ghost at the end and i love um, i mean if you can do that and do it well yeah. I, I i dig that really but yeah you're right that that just that pure it's single just, note yeah thing. it's strong it's straight mm -hmm. it's clear it, it's just it's just so just like yeah pe exactly piercing. exactly <laughs> Pierce, yeah and it, you know, you some people might not like that, but I, given the fact that we talked about singers who are using their voice as an instrument, very much so, and yeah. just sort of playing with that and being able to to push yourself in that in that way and and, and make it so so interesting to listen to. I, I it to me, it's not a it's not a sound that it's like nails on a chalkboard. You know, yeah. some people might think so. But no, I, I find it to be fascinating to, that, a, that a human voice can do that. You know, it's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, I, I love that each song has multiple textures to it. So it's not just yeah. – uh, even Mandinka isn't just a pop song. It's got so, so many different things to it. Or just mm -hmm. like you said it would be. It's just kind of a – it's a slow, down-tempo song, and she's kind of singing it tenderly. But then at the end, it, she changes. It, it, it became – more of, of a of an assault or an attack on her partner yeah. you know what, what by the time her vocals get kind of get to the end the song is taken on a different tone and tenor and i just like that's what i love listening to this album is mm -hmm. you know you get used to hearing artists and they sing you know they'll sing and they pretty much sound the same mm -hmm. um or they'll sing one you know they'll sing one song and maybe a little bit higher a little falsetto but uh you know at that point in 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 88 when i probably when i got to it I wasn't used to hearing that type of diversity within a song yeah from a vocalist i'm used to hearing it in, in music where it's changing and especially in proggy stuff mm -hmm. it's you know different movements and suites or whatever you want to call it yeah <clears throat> but not really hearing a, a, a vocalist really from one line to the next singing the same thing and it, it takes on a totally different meaning in a, in a song that's yeah. that's less than four minutes long yeah. yeah, like you get so much in so in such a short amount of time. Yeah, that that is amazing. Yeah, she had, she, a, she had a she had a clear going, too. It's not yeah, just she, one song; it's every every song. It's you know yeah. she can do this and just keep that up and just find new territory to explore. Yeah, it's, and you and you mentioned favorite. Troy is one of your favorites. That that's to me yeah. that like that's the pro like at the end it gets really proggy. It's like the of course, and it's also the longest track on the album. You know, it's so. like this. Yeah, it's like this epic thing mm -hmm. and. You know, she's calling into you know some you know some biblical imagery. I mean, that's where the 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 title, the lion and the cobra comes uh, yep. comes in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and talking about you know Troy and, and burning it down. Like, she really kind of has a grasp for you know the metaphors that she wants to use. You know, yep. and again, I, I, so, for someone that young, um, th to have that insight it, it, and to be able to really kind of put it in, um, and you can't help but stop and listen to it. You know, you even, often even, wonder even too, the poppier like, stuff. You often wonder too, is is this a lot of this stuff that she she you know a lot of like sort of religious passages, and you wonder if that was like really kind of instilled in her by her by her like her mom or something. Was she like that kind of you know? Did it go there where she was like very stern and strict and you know like very religious or something? And yeah. you know, to grow up so. in that in that vein is just you know she she struggled she throughout her yeah. career has struggled with the nature of religion she's right. she's become a buddhist or muslim uh her last album i think was in uh she's exploring all faiths she's yeah. she's trying to explore you know expand the mind a little bit but and what know. does that mean and what does that mean right and right. and what it mean, what does religion mean and her her last album i think was 2015 or 2016 mm -hmm. and the lead single was called take me to church 
Yeah. You know, but she didn't mean a Catholic church necessarily, but what, but, but church in the, <clears throat> in the notion of what does a church mean to some part of the a, journey, a, pla- a, a, a place of, of respite, you know, or a place to kind of get away it's or a place inter- of solitude, I, I, you know, yeah, so, so she's challenging that. those yeah. things. I always you know. looked upon that as a personal thing in any yeah. way. And, you know, it's just a, to me, it's just a building. If you go to church, you know, whatever, but you know, you're exploring different faiths, you know, you're, you're exploring new territory. You're trying to understand something bigger and, but, but also keeping it personal. And I think yeah. that she went through a lot and she changed her name quite a few times. When yeah. I think she was changed it twice. She was like, she changed it name to and then she, Ma- you know, uh, first one was Magda, Muslim. Magda, Magda yeah. Davit. Yep. But now she's known as uh Shuhada Sadaket. Yeah. Um, but, but she, but her album, she puts out her albums as Sinead O'Connor. Sinead so. O'Connor. Yeah. And she's still, <laughs> she's not like, Oh, don't ever call me that. It's, you know, I think those are just, these are just yeah. kind of like iterations of her. That's right. Right. Yeah. Of, of mm-hmm. just like when Prince changed his name to whatever the symbol was, right. It mm-hmm. wasn't like, don't ever call him Prince. It's just that he's he's evolving into whatever he's evolving into in person. Or Cat Stevens with uh, was it? Yeah, Yusef. Yusef. Yeah, which yeah, is his, so, yeah. yeah. So this is this was the same thing. Is she just going through all these different different phases? And yeah, some of it has to do with <clears throat> with some of the mental illness stuff that she's gone through. She's you mm-hmm. know she lost a son uh, to to you know drug addiction, uh, and it was he was quite young, it was like thirteen or fifteen or something like that. So yeah, um, she's she's had her share. You know, and and I and I again, it, it kind of comes down, I think, to um, getting getting popular, right? You get you get her second album, which was a monster thing. Everyone's falling for her. Then all of a sudden, everybody hates her. Yeah. You know, how do you deal? They say it's hard enough to deal with with fame. Fame. That's right. The, su- the sudden rush of fame and having access to everything. How do you deal with yeah. everybody adoring you, and then the next day, everyone is like, "You're the worst thing ever." Hmm. I can't imagine. As as uh, what was that? Ni- that was ni- 1992. That's right. So yeah. what? 20, 24, 26. Something it's very like that. very easy to get caught up in that too. It's very easy to turn around and be so judgmental and be like, oh, I, you know, I can't, I, you know, you know, you, you know what I mean? Like it's it, yeah. that that's where you you know the whole idea of, of separating art from the artist comes in. But in this case, because her music is so integrated with her beliefs and like you say like you know uh the you know the activist aspect of it it's just you you really can't separate yeah. I, I think i think it it it, it you know. inspired her to double or triple down on it yeah mm-hmm. right she said okay you know you're gonna you're gonna make me a pariah you're gonna make me an outsider yeah i'm gonna tell then i am now free to tell it like it is and to mm-hmm. say what i want you know, because, you know, and there's some freedom in that, right? That she's sure. no longer constrained or shackled by That's right. being yeah. a pop star and, and what they expect. She, you know, and, and who knows? I, 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 you know, I don't think she knew what was going to happen when she did it. But, you know, it was kind of like a scorched earth policy. She just kind of everything was kind of left to ruin. So what's left after that is do whatever you want. Yeah. Right. Because there's no expectations. And, you know. Um, so, so that's why she was able to even just go further and just kind of right. do whatever. Do, yeah. yeah. So she wanted to do a, you know, a jazz album, you do a jazz album, you do whatever mm-hmm. you, you want to do something that's more introspective. You want to, you know, uh, pursue religious endeavors and see what that means to your life and, and make music based on that. Yep. Um, you know, she, she's just had an eclectic career ever since. So, um, so getting back to what you said in the beginning, which, which kind of catches up to her now is that she won't. Uh, play any she won't play any songs from lion and the cobra live right she said a bit it's, it was my therapy why you know that's like me going back and revisit you know someone going back and revisiting a therapist when you've already had the therapy you don't go, need to talk to them again about it right yeah. mm-hmm. theoretically uh and that was what this album was for her so if you were <clears throat> if you're a fan right mm-hmm. of, of and you're gonna go see you probably are aware of this so you're probably like okay i'm gonna listen to some newer stuff or i have no i have no clue Right, like mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of like going to a dead show. You you don't know. You're probably you're not going to get Casey Jones, Uncle John's band, and Trucking and Touch of Grey in one show. If you get yeah. one, you're lucky, right? That's right. It's yeah. like whatever. Two shows kinda, are alike. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like yeah. a roll of the dice, and the That's, dice yeah. have forty sides each. You know, like you don't know what the guys. same way. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, does you know if you were going to bring somebody, would you would you forewarn them? And 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 that being said, does does the does the artist owe us anything? Are we owed? You know, nothing compares to you. Are we owed? Uh, am, am I? Do I deserve or am I owed to to hear Mandinka live because I love that album? Does, do artists owe it to me, or do they just say, 
Is it, is it, you know, whatever. That's a very good, that's a tough question, but it's a good one. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It depends on the fan, it, what kind of fan you are, I guess, or it depends on the artist. And, and you, and if you are that kind of fan that, that truly understands, uh, that you like to get kind of get, you know, climb inside their head a little bit. And, 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 and as, as you grow or get older, if you were to ask me this question at the age of 15, I would have been like, oh, yeah, yeah, hell yeah. They always, you know, we want, we yeah. want those songs. But no, you know, you, you know, as you get older, you understand they're human beings too. I mean, they, they, they progress, they, you know, they learn, they live. Uh, so as a fan, you, you, you would come to expect that, but you know, but like you say, if you're going to bring somebody, yeah, I, I will most definitely forewarn them. To say, <laughs> get ready, get ready. You might not hear what you want to hear. You know? Yeah. And, I, and I'm always, you know, I've always been a, pro, a, pro, a proponent of, of artists kind of stretching those boundaries anyway. Yeah. Even if they're, they are doing those songs, I don't mind them changing the arrangements. And I, cause I kind of love it. I want something a little bit more from a live setting, but I think it's yeah, nice to me. know ahead of time though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ca case in point, we, we've, we don't mention it often, but we went to, we went to go see Bob Dylan. Yeah. And we were, <laughs> we were expecting, I was certainly expecting. Sure. Yeah. So I was expecting something, mm -hmm. but Bob Dylan, the artist decided, decides what we get. Right. As yeah. an, he's, you know, he, you know, he's not, he's a legacy artist, but he doesn't, he's not the great, he's not on the greatest hits tour. Mm -hmm. Like someone like McCartney is or journey right. or whoever he still tours because he wants to. And he does things that he wants to do because he wants to do, because it tickles his fancy at that time. Yeah. <laughs> and we went, we went and we're kind of, you know, uh, to put it apropos to what he did, we were be bewitched, be bothered, be bothered and bewildered. Cause we didn't know he was doing all standards. We didn't know. We didn't realize that that was going to make up the line share and people that were walking out were, were pissed. They were, they were justifiably, they, the, the, the anger was palpable that people least, paid all this money to go see an icon and they didn't get blown in the wind. They didn't get tangled up in blue. Right. They didn't get the hurricane. You know, they didn't get any, any of that. They got a bunch of standards and this guy that was detached from the audience, but that was the artist's art. Yeah. Right. That was the artist. You know, that's the way I look at it now is, is the, this was the artist making art. The funny thing was, was that we we before the show started, we were standing there and these groups, these people were actually having a conversation about, oh, I've seen Dylan like countless number of times. And, he, yeah. you know, this and and you would think that they would know this about him. It was so surprising to me that this huh. this guy, one of these guys was just so mad, like he was just yeah. he stormed out of he there in a rage. They were and living. I'm like, really? I mean, come on. I mean, you. you I mean, we were scratching our you, heads. We didn't know. So we didn't so, know. Uh, you well, know. We loved it. We we thought it was. That's okay. This is Dylan. I guess this is what he's yeah. about. Yeah. So, so I I think that kind of opened my <laughs> eyes too to to yeah. understanding that. You know. So if I went to go see Sinead O'Connor, mm -hmm. uh, expect the unexpected. Mm -hmm. Right. Ex expect to not That's not right. know what's going to happen and and just go go with an open mind. Yeah. Right. Because because that's what that's what this first album challenged me to do from the beginning. Yeah. Is is opened my mind about my notions about about female singers and about rock music. And again, I was very you know in in eighty seven very much into the rock and roll stuff. And you know mm -hmm. the cult came out in eighty seven electric. So I was on a I was on a trajectory. And this this album comes out, which is totally different and, and makes a different statement and, and really demands that you kind of you listen to it. Yeah. You know, right. that, that she's got something to say. It wasn't just a collection of pop songs that this Irish girl wrote. It's, it's a woman, a mature woman, having a, about to have a child as well. Mm -hmm. uh, she was married to the, the drummer John Reynolds, um, making this, this powerful statement, which uh, I, you know, I can't overstate or understate the, the, the power of, of this album. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. when, you, when you put it on, uh, you got to give it a listen. You can't be doing, you can't be vacuuming. No, you know, while you're doing this, you can't, you can't be <laughs> oh. doing it really, you can't, you can't be like balancing your checkbook or play solitaire. You kind of have to really, you know, and I really, I highly suggest you, you know, if you're listening on Spotify, the lyrics are there, get, follow the lyrics along too. Cause you really kind of take a trip with her, uh, through, often, through what she's going through. I'm often very critical of the eighties, you know, as a whole, like looking back and saying, mm -hmm. you know, I prefer the seventies and the, like the, the glorious music that came out. Uh, and during that decade, and so such diverse amount of it, and I always so you, are, are you are you like are you like that woman in Field of Dreams? Like, no, <laughs> you had two fifties and skipped to the seventies. <laughs> <laughs> I was there for the sixties. No, you had two fifties and skipped to the seventies. But it's 
but it's but it's certainly albums like this that make you take stock and say, you know what, the '80s did had something to offer, yeah. and this was the this was exactly this kind of music yeah. that I prefer, like out of the '80s, like you know Paul Simon's Graceland, <clears throat> Peter Gabriel's stuff, and uh, even U2 to a certain extent, mm -hmm. and you know all these the, the different bands that were doing this sort of world, giving us something more from of a different culture or something that that I just found maybe I didn't appreciate at the time kind of just rolled right by, but it just, mm. you know, but, but it was so different that it was, it was interesting. So yeah, this, this is some of the finer points of the eighties for me. You know, I think the the, yeah. the thing that I, I always speak, I think is the biggest, uh, unfortunately, like the rock music of the eighties is probably what I'm talking about is yeah. a lot of the leftover bands from the seventies coming oh. over and not trying anything new, not yeah. necessarily. They're trying to do what they did, but with a more polished sound and they yep. never, never really worked for me. So, that, you know, that's probably what I'm referring to. <laughs> and I, I, ironically enough, there, there is a band that I, that I latched onto in the 90s that I felt was, this, was the spiritual, if not the vocal successor to Sinead O'Connor. Do you know who mm -hmm. I'm talking about? Have any idea? Um, also from Ireland. So that, that, that's a hint maybe kind cranberries of cranberries cranberries yeah dolores okay. o'rourke and when i heard yeah. linger and zombie yes and dreams mm -hmm. i heard echoes of sinead o'connor's vocal style yeah mm -hmm. it's it's there so it's got to be something in you know from that country of you know what what they bring you know with with their you know accent or, or whatever you know, or what, what music they were exposed to as a child, maybe something more traditional types mm -hmm. of music, and then transplant it into rock. Because when I listen to the Cranberries, I get the, it's like the echoes of, of what Sinead O'Connor might have done. That's right. Had yeah. she stayed on, especially like Zombie. That To me, <laughs> Zombie is like, is like a tribute song to, to Sinead O'Connor. Yeah. And it it's absolutely, it's absolutely, it's got the it's same... It's a great song, for yeah. Sure, but it's got the same message. It's got the the vocal style is. But very it could much also be one of the most grating. Songs. Oh, I love it. Oh. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. But uh, I'm thinking of The Office. I'm thinking of like <laughs> Ed Helms when he's singing it, like yeah. and, and, and Jim, and like you know, like Krasinski's just It'll like, ruin anything. <laughs> and, 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 you know, but it can, it can have that effect if you're yeah. not if you yeah. don't like that kind of voice and those yeah. inflections and yeah. But there's also Clannad, you know, like yep. uh, and and Enya. Who uh, does appear on this on this debut? Yeah, but I like that stuff too. I like that sort of soft, ethereal. Yeah, and use more the atmos traditional. Yeah, atmospheric, Gaelic, you know, kind yep. of sound. I love I love that exotic stuff that you just just sit back and really absorb it and take it yeah. in. You know, so yeah, that's not, just music you know, for sitting down and listening to. That's know? right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Well, as as we wind down, mm -hmm. um, you know, we we did talk about a lot you know probably most of our favorite songs you know for me it's gonna it's always gonna be the up tempo man dinka jerusalem uh i want your hands on me you know e like even the one with it. mc light i actually had the remix of that and had a couple of i had the cassette single of that so i was digging that as well either one that that, that 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 song was actually in uh nightmare on elm street yeah yeah uh, it's effective it? it's, uh, it's uh, nightmare on elm street four was it i think or uh, yeah, the Dream Master. So that, yeah. that she mm -hmm. actually got a little, uh, got some more exposure from there. Um, just call me Joe. The very end song, very heavy, like overdriven guitar. It's just, it's just an overdriven guitar for the most part, and her with a very tender vocal. Um, mm -hmm. Again, just matching up these different things. An overdriven heavy guitar, just playing, you know, uh, individual hold, notes of a chord, and then her singing and, he, and her um, holding her own. Yeah, that just pair, yeah, these yeah. interesting pairings of. Mm -hmm her voice with different different types of arrangements. Now, what yeah. about you? What 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 peaks what piqued your interest before um, we send everybody on their uh, way? Uh, songs, you mean? Like yeah. what are my favorite? Like the first two. Yeah. Like I said. Jackie and Mandinka. Jackie and Mandinka. That one two punch right there yeah. is, is what really gets me going for this album. Mm -hmm. And then just the rest of it is just it's just great. I, I think it's a perfect album. I don't think there's a yeah. bad song on it. Uh, lay your hands on me. I think is you know it might be a little it's a little naive, but it's also it does its job. You know I kind of like that. It, it, it gets to the point. It's, that yeah, sexy, the, you know, the lyrics yeah. are to the point. You that's know right. that's it's yeah. it's you know there's no beating around the bush. So it's it's a good yeah. you know yeah. I, I just really enjoy listening to it because again mm -hmm. it harkens back to 
kind of you know around this time i think i got into midnight oil as well which is like another political <laughs> band and i loved it like diesel and dust you know so i was, Down I was under. Yeah, yeah i was kind of getting all these yep. all these different yep. all these new experiences was were kind of <laughs> yep. coming in and in, in, around this this era mm -hmm. um where i was kind of really starting to open up a little bit so um it's it's and this is just what you got to check this out if you never listen to it forget about you know forget about or, you know uh nothing compares to you like forget i'm gonna say forget it i know, you know go I, go, yeah. go to this out go to this album this has got I the fire yeah. it's got the spirit and this is an attitude. album that you and i can totally identify because we're so different in terms of you know like yeah. i'm it's the perfect album for the two of us because you you know you you're leaning more towards the pop rock side of it i i love the the more atmospheric stuff so you can put the two together and and, and there you go perfect marriage right there <laughs> Two two so, great tastes that taste great hand together. In hand. There you go. You got like, your pop in my prog. You got your prog in my pop. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yep. So there it is. That's gonna do it for this episode of the 3324 podcast. I made it through. You did. And actually your voice improved. I'm I'm gonna make a rhyme. I made it through thanks to Grogu. There you go. Grogu's green now tea. He, now I wanted to ask, is he known as just the child on there or Grogu? Yeah, because this came out before before his name was revealed. Before okay. he was named, so he's the child, the child. green tea. Yes. <laughs> the child of green tea. So thank God. you, Grogu, for, for getting me through this episode. You can find us on social media on Facebook and Instagram at 3324 Podcast. So go there. Uh, a lot of fun. We we give you daily doses. Of, of interesting fun trivia birthdays celebrating films as well uh you know it, i think it look i think it'll look nice in your feed when you're scrolling to see the stuff yeah. that we post um if you're not into the whole social media thing then visit us on youtube you can see the video versions of this uh and you can also see our 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 archive of live shows mm -hmm. which we do every every do. other week when when the schedule is right but we are pretty consistent with that as well so um, that's going to do it for the line and cover. Definitely check this out. It's on all the streaming services. So it's a highly recommend, um, from 1987. So for Eric, this has been Dean and we will catch you on the flip side. You've been listening to the 3324 podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like subscribe and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important. So make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324 podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 